And um, as you, as I hope you know, Facets runs a teaching series every month or so with a discussion after the film. And today we're joined by Alexandra Fox, who is a psychotherapist here in Chicago. She's been working in the Chicago area for about 13 years. Um, and is going to talk with us a little bit about what she saw in the film, but I'm very interested in hearing other people's reactions tonight as well. So let me ask you to just start us off, I guess, and can you give us a sort of professional profile <laughs> of our hero? Hmm. Um, well, I mean, I'd love to open this up to microphone. Con oh, microphone? Hmm. Here, can you hear me better with that? Thanks. I can't even tell if it's on. Um, I'd love for this to become more of a conversation because, you know, obviously this is a delicate topic, especially um, with what's been going on in the news these days. So um, part of what I'd like to share in this is there is very little research into what defines sexual addiction, sexual compulsion versus sex predator. Um, and so as you saw in this film, um, Brandon is clearly st struggling with a variety of uh, compulsive behaviors. Um, and that's, to me, where I see his fundamental problem lay. I saw a lot of predatory behavior from a lot of the characters in the film. Um, but for him in particular, I think there was a lot of, um, a lot of vulnerability, a lot of suffering. Um, and a lot of shame, which lends to the title. Um, but I'd love to hear from all of you as to sort of your perspectives and what you saw in Brandon and, and your, your thoughts. So if you want to comment, we've basically got two, these two microphones, so you can either move down, which is what I encourage, or just shout and we'll repeat the question if we need to. But is there anyone who'd like to join in? Well, let me ask this. Let's just get reactions to the film. Who, who found him to be a sympathetic character? <laughs> don't, don't be afraid to answer. <laughs> okay, who did not find him to be sympathetic? Okay, what is it? What makes him sympathetic to you? Uh, it just he just seems to be struggling in this lonely life. I mean, and you know, he, he can't even deal with his sister in a non-confront confrontational way until almost, you know, it was too late, almost. Mm -hmm. But uh, it just seems like, you know, he's trying to fill that void like as if it were like alcohol or something. With right. sex. And that's one of the big problems with determining from a psychological perspective whether someone is a sexual addict or, or sexually compulsive or engages in sexually compulsive behavior. They're sort of an interchangeable term. Um, but the fact that he um, had such low self-esteem and was having so much trouble connecting with people is very much what comes with sexual addiction. And it's hard to determine, too, if is it a compulsion? Is it uh, impulse control? Is it OCD? Or is it to be treated like an addiction, as in alcohol or substance use? And I... and and. There's no, there's no clear answer right now as to how to treat someone suffering like this. Which direction do you lean? I mean, just as an understanding that there's not necessarily a consensus among professionals. I mean, just in my experience, which is all I can speak for, and, and in the literature I've read, that, that treating it like an addiction has proven to have results. So the idea of, of the 12-step program with someone um, that is trying to manage it. So it's dealing it in both um, a psychodynamic and a cognitive behavioral way. So it's actually giving them tools to work with those addictions and the triggers and the urges. So, Wait, go ahead. Can you even point out, like, um, is, is, the, is the addiction really interfering with his life or is it actually helping him cope? Because there's a lot of that self, what's it called, the um, self-comfort uh, when you're masturbating. Right. Self-soothing. Self-soothing, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but I don't, I, I didn't really see sex as really his, his, his problem. I mean, clearly, and his sister too. No, it's um, just managing the compulsions was the problem. It's really sort of broken, damaged, 
yeah. people now kind yeah. of struggling as adults. I think the filmmakers showed that in a lot of different ways, you know, like Brandon watching cartoons and, mm -hmm. you know, acting like a kid with his sister. So, so I guess where, I don't know if it's, I mean, I know that the, the synopsis of the movie is about sex addiction, but I didn't really see that to be really his problem. So maybe you can... Well, that, that speaks to the more OCD approach, which is he was managing his depression and his anxiety through acting out in this way, which is a way to manage it. But was it working for him? Not particularly. I mean, well, it, he eventually was going to, was, it was going to interfere with his job and, and with his ability to, I mean, we're generally wired to connect and he was really struggling to connect with anyone. So. Right here? Well, well, well all I saw about him was negative. I mean, he was a shallow person. I, I, I didn't see anything good about the guy. And uh, mm -hmm. even his sex, he had a bad rap. You know, talking to the girl, he don't know how to talk to the girl. Mm -hmm. The guy punched him, punched him and uh, 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 I, I just, uh, there's so much, if a sexually compulsive guy might have fantasies of uh, kinkiness, now that is stimulating. But his sex, I didn't find it stimulating for me. He couldn't relate with the black girl. He just turned his back on her. What the heck? Right. Almost like that almost was too much of a possible relationship. Right, right, right. And it right. seemed to completely, you know, sort of rattle him. And then he had to call a hooker just to, to sort of come back to that place. I got some quotes, for instance, for some people that were in um, SA, which is Sex Addiction Anonymous. And I thought it was kind of interesting because it, it spoke to this film. Um, I put this down because I thought it'd be interesting. Hold on. Where is this? Um, this is a quote from, from someone in essay. Um, the problem many of us felt inadequate, unworthy, alone, and afraid. Our insides never match what we saw on the outside of others. Um, we became true addicts. Sex with self, promiscuity, adultery, dependency, relationships, and more fantasy. Uh, please connect with me and make me whole, we cried, with outstretched arms, lusting after the big fix. We gave away our power to others, which produced guilt, self-hatred, remorse, emptiness, and pain. And we were driven ever inward, away from reality, away from love, lost inside ourselves. And I think that's what you were saying there, that he's so lost inside himself that he can't relate. So his longest relationship was four, four mm -hmm. months, and, yeah. and then yeah. when he picks up women, they're all married, they got a ring on their finger, mm -hmm. I mean, he's, he can't commit to I, I just didn't. Right. Yeah, no, I don't think he was interested in committing to anyone. But it, I thought it was interesting the way um, the director had the woman from the very beginning show up at the end of the film with almost this lioness mane, you know, um, to, to the degree that made me, after seeing it a couple of times, start to see a lot of people in the film as predators. And she very much had this kind of predatory look on her face, too, which suddenly gets you questioning things in a whole different way as well. And his boss and his behaviors, um, there were lots of different ways in which people were preying on each other. And say a bit more about that, because what, what do you mean when you say that the, she was being predatory, that the boss was being predatory? I think I know what you mean. But I mean, in, in different ways. I felt like they both had, they all had their techniques, and I think the main character had his, um, and that, that almost seemed like the clear initial predator in the film. But then I thought that the boss looked just you know, in, in his sort of BS lines in the bars and whatever, trying to pick up girls, that there was very much of a, a predatory aspect to he was out looking for action kind of feeling. He certainly seemed a lot more, the boss certainly seemed a lot more dishonest to me. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I feel like our guy, Brandon, mm -hmm. whatever else you want to call him, he's not, doesn't seem to me to be fundamentally dishonest. Right. I mean, he's, he's, 
pretty much straight with everybody he meets. Mm -hmm. Like his encounters, the terms are really clear. Either right. he's paying for it or mm -hmm. both parties understand that this is just going to be... Right, because he almost waits for them to come to him. Which, I mean, can be interpreted as predatory too, that oh. he, he times it in a way. I'm glad that you brought that up because, so, if it's, um, if it's a mutual encounter, how is this predatory? Or, or if he's right. sitting and waiting, it's predatory? Or just the look of the lady on the train is predatory? <coughs> yeah. To me, that seems like a real stretch, so I'm going to need to yeah. hear a little bit more. Well, I mean, I, but that, that's why I hesitate to, to classify as pre I don't know if any of you read... Um, Catherine Deneuve's article recently in the Times on the hashtag Me Too movement and this sort of the French push against assigning men that are flirtatious or that make moves to women as automatically being predatory. I think it's a, it's, it's a tough word but I think we can either spread it thin or be very careful how we use it. What, like, the woman, I'm sorry, but like the woman on the train mm -hmm. talked about that being predatory. She was a passive participant. She, she smiled. That, that seems very unfair to say that she was predatory because she smiled at a man on a train. Well, well I, I think, I think that's more. naive in the sense that the director clearly changed her demeanor right. from the beginning of the film right. to the end of the film. I agree with you. In the beginning of the film, they were both sitting there having whatever fantasies they each were having, and they completely stayed within their realm. He made a move which I felt suggested a predatory Absolutely. move at the very beginning. What was that? What, touching her hand? No, when she's he moved right behind, right behind her, her and got off at a stop he had no intention of getting off at. Yeah. He um, the crowd. So, you're right. saying opportunity so in that crowd. sense, I felt like it was yeah. definitely suggesting yeah. it. Whether he would have accepted her no, had she turned around and said, please back off, that doesn't excuse... Well, I also think it was predatory where when he was chasing her through the crowd and the director chose to show us his frustration. Right. But he wasn't able to fill that void. Right. So in this predatory... Uh, right. So, so the question is, is, again, it's these terms we throw out that, that suddenly make someone almost, and maybe you can offer some perspective from a legal perspective, it has a criminal quality to it. When you look up sex predator, a lot of right. definitions are, has right. been convicted of a right. predatory you know, act. So I, I, I hate to throw around words that then define somebody in a certain way, but you can have compulsive behavior and not be an obsessive compulsive personality. You can have predatory behavior and not be a predator. It's, I think it's a fine line, but I think it's worth it. I think she wanted him to follow her. And well, that was the certainly second, the suggestion, right. it seems. The second the time around, right. it seems to just confirm that. Right. And then I guess we don't know what ended up. But, but it again, like it, you know, it's... The second time, but she was like... Bring it. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's the the first time I got this sense in her look that she did get caught up in the whole back and forth, mm -hmm. but suddenly woke up and was like, mm, no, I right. don't want this. <laughs> Which is it hard? I mean, and I think this is where women do get caught in precarious situations and that they don't recognize the danger of the situation they put themselves in. And but then, then the, when you look at the second part, though, she was definitely not right. timid or feeling like she made a mistake for Right, front door. right. Mm -hmm. exactly. So that's why right. I, well, the, and I if just... If not showed it the second time, we'd be able to... Right. Well, that's a little bit why the sort of the way he chose her to have suddenly have this mane of hair and had a very close-up of her face. You know, whereas before the close-ups were of his male parts, here it was a close-up of her face, and so I thought it was an interesting choice. Yeah. Do, do, do you think his sister was a pre predator? I, well, I thought that was the best thing in his life. I know. And he couldn't relate to her. Right. Although, although it, the one thing that struck me was when um, they were, uh, he was talking to his um, work colleague on the date, and they were talking about old couples that don't talk, 
And she was, he was saying they're bored with each other, and she was saying, well, maybe they're so connected they don't need to talk. And I almost got that sense from him when he just got a sense something was wrong. And she didn't have to say it, although she did actually say, could you please come? But besides that, there was just this feeling of, that's it, Brendan. You see, this is what it's like to just be connected to someone that they don't need to say, but you know something is wrong here. And I thought that was kind of nicely done, that it was sort of this, this underlying connection that really did exist between the two of them. I think they both, I mean, obviously limited information, but I do think they both must have experienced some early childhood traumas oh, yeah, no. of some kind. There was no parents involved, and you know, he said he was playing with his cousin and somehow hit the ceiling. I mean, what kind of a room were they in where when you're just a kid on someone's feet and you hit the ceiling enough to wet yourself and, I don't know. So it's I think an interesting move on the part of the film to just leave that out. Right. You know, to not give you a, an origin story. Right. Um, and let you just assume. But the fact that he brought up the bump on his head, which was a bit random in the conversation, of, and, and her cutting all showed a history of For trauma. sure, for sure. It goes back to the quote that Carrie Mullen had about, you know, we're not bad people, we just come from a bad place. Exactly, it was like exactly. Very, the biggest quote in the movie. Right, yeah. I know, which was beautiful. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, obviously I wouldn't do what I do if, if I couldn't fundamentally believe that when people come in, that they aren't born bad. I do have a question, though. When it comes to Brendan, it seems like, you know, we all have sexual urges, so everyone knows that, when I get horny, et cetera, et cetera. But it seems like Brendan just couldn't turn the thoughts at all to agree with exactly. Always constantly honest, no matter what the context. Right, and that's a little bit why treating someone with a sexual addiction is tricky, because there it would be, as opposed to the addiction model, it'd be really working with impulse control. It's yeah. almost like a gambler in Vegas or a horse exactly. racing. Exactly. Yeah, it's reminding yeah. me of that because right. alcohol and, and, and drugs, it's, it's just mm -hmm. uh, To be honest, food. Mood change of mind altering chemical or, or alcohol, whereas yep. gambling and sexual behavior, it's just. Different and so. well, what's hard is that it's it's every it surrounds them, right? right? Because right. if you're if you're right. addicted to pornography and and nowadays, I mean, this is what's troubling to raising kids in this social media environment and with the internet. The more and more research is showing that boys struggle now because if they are exposed to unbelievable amounts of pornography online that then when they're in a relationship it's harder to get stimulated because they're seeing a lot of funky shit out there that's true. <laughs> you know? but here's one other thing is it, it seemed to me that for most of this movie this compulsion or addiction or whatever it is works for brandon just fine like Right. He's got some issues he's got to work out, but it works to his advantage at work. He's got a boss who wants to go out every night and hit on women. So it's good that Brandon wants right. to do that too. But is it sustainable? It's kind of like, you know, heroin. A lot of people work on heroin, and it yeah. seems like they are okay. But it's a train hitting for, heading for a brick wall. Well, maybe, but, but the, where I was going with the comment is that, you know, how would this story look if you had a woman in that lead role? Like, the, the world just seemed set up for this to be pretty okay for Brandon. Like, Brandon doesn't have to get married. Brandon doesn't have to settle down if he doesn't want to. If he wants to, then it's a problem, but he doesn't really have to. Right. And if he just wants to work all the time and go out and party all night, which is one way of characterizing what he's doing, mm -hmm. the world's not going to stop him from doing that. No. No, but if he is human just like it would be for a woman and yes some of it may be to get married and have a family but it's also just to connect as a human being that eventually that it's not really a sustainable lifestyle you know in terms of of not hitting some serious depression or anxiety from it mm -hmm. there was so much more to it than that though he I mean, sure, there was times when you'd go out on a night with the boss and you could have all these sexual encounters or whatever, mm -hmm. but then there was that other side of the impact of it that he can't get through a day of work. He's going in the bathroom right. to 
can right. release himself, which obviously is you know, not. Some people smoke, some people get a couple Yeah, I mean, I guess to me it didn't it didn't look until kind of far into the movie. It just didn't look to me like it was costing him much of anything. Right. Right. To have this compulsion. Well, I mean, his hard drive. I'm not saying that's right, right or wrong, yeah. that it should or that the movie should have been made differently. Yeah. But I'm just, it's interesting that. Yeah. Yeah. Except it's not socially acceptable. Yeah. So, right. Well, hang on. Can I comment over here? It seemed like in, in the movie there. A lot of the encounters were, there was a lot of mutual flirtation going on. Mm -hmm. yeah, the girl in the bar, I mean, mm -hmm. that was definitely a flirtation. The girl on the train, even in the first scene especially, I mean, she almost looked like she was going to have an orgasm in, in, in the seat there. Right. Very intense scene. That's a, it seemed like mutual. Mm -hmm. In fact, she was flirting more than he was just looking at her, you know. Mm -hmm. So is that predatory on his part, uh, uh, those kinds of encounters? I mean, what do you think? I don't think so. Right. I mean, that's I and mean, th that, but that's the fine line of, you I'm, know, where does it? I but I agree. I think women have pressure. the right to speak up, and at what point do they feel unable to? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, I also think it's important to look at Brandon as a white, single upper middle class guy who clearly is making a really good living. He's got a real nice apartment in Manhattan. So he has a lot of extra money to spend on his sex addiction. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's paying, you know, he's doing live video chats. He had a ton of paraphernalia and videos and whatever. Um, so he is, you know, I think it's also important within the context of this film to look at through that filter. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, this isn't some lower middle class guy with one credit card that he has to use for his entire family and everything, mm -hmm. right? I mean, this is a very specific right. um, lifestyle and person. And so what, what, what is the conclusion from that, or what do you, yeah, I mean, what does what that I lens is, offer? I mean, I, I think he clearly had a pornography addiction. He had access to disposable income, so he could be online whenever possible. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, he he also to me showed symptoms of the porn addiction when he couldn't get it up with the woman who he was, uh, you know, works right. with. Um, I felt like he couldn't get it up when he was having that threesome. I mean, it was such mm -hmm. a painful scene. It's a like, really like, painful scene. So painful, and it just felt like you know he just this, it wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. Right? He couldn't, he couldn't get far enough away from his pain. Right. You know? Mm -hmm. It was, I mean, this movie I find incredibly painful. Right. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. just, the whole thing is just pain. Mm -hmm. pain. So. There was a question further back. I thought well, there was. There, okay. Two things I okay. had noticed about the movie. A lot of times directors have clips of songs. But he chose when the sister was singing, he started from the very beginning all the way through to the very end. Instead of maybe having her start, then cut, oh, you did great, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Or show her when she was just finishing the song, and then they, the director's choice to have her sing the song in, through its entirety. Yeah, the pacing in general was really slow. He really kind of took his time with certain scenes. Was he trying to communicate something with that? It's up to you or you know, Probably how long it takes to penetrate the guy. The second thing is I had a continuity error. He is a heterosexual <laughs> man. He likes women. He's very into women. He looks at women, not men. And then there's just this one scene where he grows, goes into a gay den and Right. But the, that is right. But compulsive behavior does lend to going into making more dangerous choices. So even being as provocative as he was with that girl at the bar and her boyfriend, he did that deliberately. Exactly. He was starting to engage in some more risky behavior. He didn't not know that the guy was going to come after him, but. Oh, yeah, I mean... thing was like, wait, he's not gay, he's not trying to say he doesn't have a hint of... Like, <laughs> well, but I, I think he's just a very sexual being, and it doesn't really matter where it's coming from at that point. Exactly. Yeah, wherever. Well, I, well I, see, I see a decline in him. At first, he had the 
right. beautiful apartment. Yeah. And then at the end, at the, at the, he had a decline, like he was, yeah. even his clothes were shabby clothes hanging out with the run, and right. on the lonely train. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, at yeah, the no, end, that's why he's kind of spiraling. And I don't see any future for him, he's, unless he talks to you, maybe. There you go, exactly. <laughs> I'd set him straight. No, even the guy outside the bar, when you talk about how everybody was predatorial, even the guy outside the bar with the smoke, his eyes, yeah. yeah. smoke at him, and totally. then, boom, you're, you're right. he snares him. Exactly. And I, I don't think that was accidental. I Not got the all. sense that the director kind yeah, of liked brilliant. this idea of yeah. provoking a lot of yeah. different perspectives. Absolutely. You know, the filmmaker um, showed, um, you know, married people that were having affairs, dishonest affairs, we would assume. So, I mean, that was a point, too. Yeah. Right. So, I, mm -hmm. I you know, kind of just wondered about the meaning of that. Is that just to show that we all have, like, sexual desires and that, you know, marriage is a sham, we're all going to behave badly no matter what? Or what, what is, you know, what, what are the, some of the takeaways from that? Right. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean... It certainly didn't paint a, a great picture of marriage. I don't know if what Steve McQueen's background is or what his choices are, but um, yeah, no, I don't know. I don't know. What What was your take? I mean, what do you think he wanted to convey? It was almost in that? kind of just um, uh, my takeaway was that you know we're we're looking at this person who's who's in pain mm -hmm. and and coping using sex, but maybe these other people are using sex in a different way, maybe mm -hmm. more positive or less positive, but just in a different way, but it's just kind of just makes it more like a base, just need very... Well, it, it, yeah, in the scenes at the end, it almost became a little animalistic right. as they were showing him humping. It's like you were, it, it almost didn't look like a human body at one point. Yeah, it just but, got lost in it. One thought I had about the married people in the film is that you, you know, this could, a bad version of this film would be he sees happily married people and is all wistful, thinking, oh, I mm. wish I had that. Mm -hmm. And that's not what we see. You know, what we see is he's hanging out with his boss who's cheating on his wife all the time. Um, you know, meets this woman who got married, it didn't work out, she didn't even last very long, but she's still optimistic about marriage. But then you have his office mate, who's the one guy who quietly seems to have a normal marriage who says, when they're out one night, he says something like, oh, I hope my, my wife's okay with this, or something like that. And then Brandon makes the joke about, I'm late because your wife wouldn't let me, let me out of the house, or something like that. And he's like, that's not funny. You should be so lucky. And I was like, huh, that's interesting. Like this very quiet way of like slipping it in there. So there's a whole range of things. I mean, I like that it's not a movie where he's like, oh, I wish I had the Christmas card with everybody in the matching Christmas sweater. But that or also that sort of model, some some not very believable model. But I think there's a lot out there for him to choose from. It's not. I don't take this to be like a movie about the the pros of marriage per se. Like you've got a lot to choose from. But given all those possible downsides, you know, maybe there's a reason why sticking with somebody, however you want to call it, that that that. There are arguments for that sort of buried in different places in the film, some in obvious ways and some not so obvious. Well, number one, it just seems like it might be less exhausting <laughs> because honestly, by the end, it just seems so tired. Um, but I, to, to your point, there are those little suggestions that he might not be able to sustain this behavior and keep his lifestyle. That the fact is his hard drive was discovered and if he can't last more than a half hour without getting onto some porn, it's going to start interfering with his job. There's um, also the possibility that this is a, just a cycle. We yeah. only saw one loop of the cycle. Totally. Well, look at the and binge and purge he did, where he threw everything away. It was very much of a sense, this is not the first time that's happened. Yeah, I felt that way a lot, that mm -hmm. this was not the first time. Even with the, when he takes Marianne to the hotel room, he's mm -hmm. brought the Coke with him. Right. So he knows he's going to need it. Right. He's got the booze on hand. Like, he knows it's not going to go very well. He's right. been here before. Yeah, yeah. So it, it, that's, I mean, a depressing yeah. way to look at it is that you're just seeing one iteration right. of this cycle. And right. he may just be back where he started. He, like, right. had some, got some things out. But now he's, nothing's going to get better. He's just going to go back where he is. Right. Beyond the sexual urges, do you think there is something else involved psychologically, a uh, stimulation for him in terms of the actual pursuit itself? Um... 
in terms of the, just the conquest That's of right, yeah, so yeah. Like the girl in the bar obviously with the boyfriend mm -hmm. that was obviously you know grandstanding to a degree right chest to a degree. yeah i didn't pick up on that anywhere else in the film i you know i sort of seemed like it was more this build up towards then that night of more provocative choices that he was making more dangerous choices but otherwise no i mean i sort of noticed when he was out with his um the guys from work you know he put his boss in a cab and he he walked home yeah. and, you know he and didn't seem to be mm, making this kind of overture to the woman to come back and and pick him up and yet when she did he's totally game but he didn't seem to um to sort of take that on as as a driving force, but I mean, in the opening scene with the woman that you mentioned, and the closing mm -hmm. scene at the main, mm -hmm. there's a there's just a certain pursuit there, obviously, in the opening scene right there, where he actually to right. chase her as well too. Right. So I kind of felt like he was actually chasing, chasing to a degree, and even when the uh, the gay man brought him into that labyrinth, mm -hmm. he was being pursued there as well. So there's a there's right. a certain conquest happening back and forth. Right. with the characters. I wondered if the pursuit itself was actually part of the stimulation. Right, and and almost his facial expressions were, at times, it looked like a trapped animal. And, and that's what he told his sister he felt like. So that sense of, you're right, the roles kind of shifting back and forth as to prey and predator. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Ma Ma Manhattan uh, is a place that has a lot of beautiful women, and they have a lot of escorts. and. It's very easy to get hooked, hooked on something like if you got the money. Right. I think they charge three, four hundred dollars now. But I was. Thousand. We'll take your money for it. Are you sure? <laughs> and when he got an updated price? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 Oh, in the back. back, yes, please. I was just going to say, yeah, you, you may have hit it uh, right on the head about cycles, mm -hmm. and he really felt. Cause I think the reason why he came down so hard on his sister is because she kind of condemned what he was doing. Mm -hmm. And but I think at the end when he really kind of let it let it out when after what happened to his sister, he was glad she was alive. There was a sense there when that lady came up to him on the train because otherwise I think he would have probably maybe came more towards her. Mm -hmm. That he might resist, but it gave you the pot you yeah. wanted to leave you thinking you don't know what's gonna happen. Yeah, absolutely. And, I think you're right. Mm -hmm. but, so I'd like to know what people's takes were on what exactly his relationship with his sister was. Um, I mean, obviously, part of the movie is about him getting to care about her and what have you. But mm -hmm. there's all sorts of in, in, in suggestions right. that their relationship is incestuous. Yes. That there's way, like obviously some. What I've got a lot of siblings. I'd consider those some big boundary issues right. <laughs> going on in this film. Um, but since Game of Thrones, now we pretty much thought anything. <laughs> but again, that's not spelled out. And right. I don't know. No, but uh, there, there was a great line I heard once from a, a family therapist. Um, and, and a, a couples therapist, and he said, what irritates us the most in those we love is often something unresolved within ourselves. And I saw a lot of that with, with his sister, of what drove him nuts about her is a lot of stuff that he was working through. Well, where was that quote from that you just quoted? Um, just a um, couples therapist. Oh. <laughs> and I use it all the time. I should I should put his name to it, but mm -hmm. I think um, the name of the film is really what it's about. And I think that there's so much shame within the family, and you guys touched on it earlier mm -hmm. on. That obviously they suffered a lot of trauma when they were young, and that whatever it may be, that he had definite shame and guilt, and you could see that in his interactions with her. Right. And it angered him. I think his avoidance. How many phone calls that she made to him. And it's like he avoided her. He didn't want her to, he didn't want to talk to her. He didn't want to see her. He resented it when she came. He didn't, it has nothing to do with whether he cares for her or he, but I think she brings out the worst in him. And I think that he's aware of that. I think whatever ancestral things that are there, he is drawn to it and yet he is not, um, he has shame and guilt over it. Mm -hmm. right. And just like when he throws her out of the bed that time and like, right. I mean, Whereas a prostitute gives him permission, there's this sense of whatever it is he experiences. And what was interesting, I mean, I know I'm, you guys are free to judge, but my 
21-year-old son was um, watch this once with me. It's like, what a movie to watch with your mom. But, um, and, and yeah, he, he picked up on the, the attraction between him and his sister in terms of how uncomfortable he was with some of her, her physical approaches. Mm -hmm. Um, that, yeah, no, there's no question that there was And I sensed his jealousy when the boss was having sex with the sister in the other room. It, 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 yeah, it was a little confused. Fun. Right, it was yeah. a cross between disgust yeah. and jealousy. Yes. Like, that should be me. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Can a sexual predator uh, behavior be something that's coping? Well, obviously, she copes by cutting. Exactly. And uh, basically, yeah. he copes by, like, you know, having sex. So, right. Could it be a coping mechanism as well, too? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, com the sexual compulsion addiction is to some degree a coping mechanism for underlying mental health struggles. And so, absolutely. So then the predatory behavior gets tangled in there as a way in which he gets his addiction sort of addressed. So it's sort of three-way tangled, in a way. Um, but, but the manipulative quality um, is a tough one because he plays it so cool that there's almost a sense of, does, it, does that qualify as predatory? Like he's walking away, he's waiting for them to make the advance, but, but in some ways all the subtle gestures he makes leading up to that you know, almost get them to a place where they then approach him. So it doesn't look like he's a predator, but at the same time, he's sent a lot of signals in That's most of the right cases. Right. Exactly. Yeah, sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. So did you guys like the film? Of course. Okay. Music yeah. was great. And you guys know the director did 12 Years a Slave, right? Sure, right. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, so anyway. um, one last question. Mm -hmm. What? Watching this film, so when did you first see this film? Uh, oh, I saw it uh, about a month ago. So how does it feel? So I was thinking you were going to say it was longer ago, but I'm wondering no, I didn't how see it, it if, if you saw it when it came out and seeing it now, mm -hmm. if any of the things that have gone on in the world since then right. affect what you bring to the film or what you take away from it? Oh, absolutely. I think it's made us all a lot more sensitive. Not only what's going on today, but maybe because I've also seen how much the internet and social media are affecting a lot of people struggling with mental health issues. That I think it, it just brings up the um, just the pervasive quality of sex today compared to what it was in the past that I think almost numbs us out. You know, it's a little bit like we get numbed out to a lot of violence when all the Schwarzenegger films kept killing people with no blood and you're going, wait, but... <laughs> so I, I do think that we're, we're in a different world today than we have been in the past in terms of how we see sex. Mm -hmm. um, and I think these films are important. I think they, they engage us in a conversation about what is predatory behavior and what is compulsion and how do we address it and get get the shame out of it so that we can talk about it because i think shame is by its very nature what stops the conversation so um so in that sense i think the whole hashtag me too movement and the I mean, there's another one in france too that has a really funny name to it but this sense now that people are able to talk about it, I think makes a big difference. And, uh, and hopefully allows, <coughs> allows us to cope a little bit better with some of these, these urges. And... Okay, all right, one last question. Well, well, this psychologist told me one time that the Irish have a hard time relating to women. That we, uh, that's who came from Ireland. <coughs> and, um... There you go, maybe that was at the root of it. But she said they came from New Jersey. I, I bet you it was a British author that said that. <laughs> yeah, but was that true? Because she said they came from New Jersey. Well, he said who I warned it. It's not. It's not. Yeah, they're not. They're not incompatible, but they're distinctly different accounts of where they came from. Yeah. Well, thanks everybody. Thanks for sticking around. Um, there is a schedule of upcoming teach-ins. Um, just as you go past the concession stand, hanging on the wall on the right. If I had the list in front of me, I'd read it to you, but I do not. And you can read it probably more readily yourself. 
But I hope you'll come on back for more. Um, there's some very interesting stuff coming up. And thanks a lot for coming on. Nicole. Hey.